Right here, there he is. It's Victor, or should I say Victory Hovland. How's it, my friend? Welcome to my show. <laughs> Thanks, Mark, for having me on. It's uh, it's going great. I'm uh, home in Norway, just enjoying some downtown, but uh, happy to talk to you. Okay, so when you arrived back in Norway, obviously grew up in Oslo, was it like a hero's welcome after the Ryder Cup and all the conquests of 2023? <laughs> um, I, would, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, it was... It's really nice to see just kind of normal people walking up to you and and saying, "Hey, awesome playing in Italy and great season." And it seems like a lot of people are starting to watch golf, even though they might not play themselves. So, it's been it's been cool to to kind of be a a, a part of of getting golf uh, a little bit bigger um, back home. I'm sure you. I'm so glad you would say that because I was lucky to be over there in Rome for the Ryder Cup and. I couldn't help but think, you know, in a country like Italy, where golf is way down the popularity charts, right? There, there had to be some kids that went, I want to be like these guys. I want to I wanna be like Victor and Rory and Rambo and company. Did, did you feel what I was feeling after the whole thing there? Yeah, it was, it was wild. Um, you know, I, I don't know where everyone was from. Obviously, there was a lot of uh, international people coming to, to watch this play, but Hopefully there are some Italians uh, there as well paying attention because I remember talking to uh, Eduardo Molinari, Molinari and he's obviously from Italy and I might be wrong, but I think there's close to 50 million people in Italy and there's not that many registered golfers in the country. So uh, there's obviously huge potential there to, to grow the game and, and get some more players introduced to it. Okay, speaking of huge potential, let's take you back. Okay, and then we'll sort of venture through your career and share some, because because I'm fascinated by what you've done as a young, you know, aspirant golfer and now champion. Um, growing up in Norway, I wouldn't think that golf is right on the top of the popularity charts in sports either. So how does a young kid from Norway get into golf and then eventually find his way over to college and dominate here as well? Yeah, my dad worked as an engineer in, in the States mm -hmm. and I was, I think around three years old. And when he came back from the States, he had brought a golf set. Uh, Cause he, he just got introdu introduced to the game there, driving back and forth to, to work, driving past the driving range and a golf course. And um, yeah, uh, I just started hitting my first few shots when I was about three or four years old. Obviously in the winter, I would shut things down and, and uh I would just go to school and and uh, hang out with my friends. And I also did Taekwondo and I played uh, soccer for a few years. Uh, and it wasn't until I was maybe 11 or 12, I decided, hey, dad, I, I kind of want to keep playing golf in the winter instead of shutting it down for four or five months. And uh, ever since then, we had a it used to be the old airport in, in Oslo. It used to be a, a, an airport hangar. And they turned it into a driving range. So in the winter months, I would just spend a few hours every single day just pounding balls into the net. Mm -hmm. And it's it was the only place in Norway in the winter we could see maybe 70 or 80 yards of the ball flight. Really? Uh, everywhere else, it was just kind of you're hitting into a net that's 10 feet in front of you. Okay. So there, at least you could you could have some fun and and hit some targets up there. And and uh, I was lucky to have a few friends around me that you know, it made it enjoyable to go there and, and practice. So you obviously improve and you win junior events over there and then you get recruited. And here's a boy from, I'm a recovering college golf coach, so I can understand this because I'm a foreigner as well, right? So I can understand what a guy from Norway showing up in Stillwater, Oklahoma at Oklahoma State must have felt like. Let's talk about some culture shock and change then. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Oklahoma is not that similar to, to Norway, but what I really liked about it was, and I visited a couple other schools, but I hadn't been to the United States very many times before going to school, uh, going to college. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think I played two, uh, junior events over there, the U S junior amateur, and that was in South Carolina. And then I played a Thunderbird, uh, in Arizona. Yeah. So those are the only points of reference that I had. And what I just really liked is that it was a small town, Stillwaters. There's 50,000 people there. Mm -hmm. There's not that many things to do. Everything is basically around the college. And we had a great golf course there. 
great history uh, in, in terms of college golf mm -hmm. with Oklahoma State. And every person there was just – we kind of had the same goals in mind. We wanted to play the PGA Tour, and we want to win a national championship. So for me, a just a kid from Norway, it was very easy for me to integrate into that culture. Yeah. And also what I really liked was that almost the whole team was American – uh, almost every single, like I would say half the team was from Oklahoma and all of them, uh, they basically grew up living and just breathing Oklahoma state golf and just Oklahoma state football. It was, it was in the culture yeah. and it was just so much easier for me, especially when I had a, a fellow countryman of mine, Christopher Ventura, he, he had been there for two years when I got there. So it, it honestly made it just very easy to to uh, to just kind of know where to go. And and uh, we would just hang out all day. And so it was it was easy. You played under coach Alan Bratton, who himself was a hell of a player and turned professional. And and so now I want you to put on your coaching hat a little bit. And and for the young golfer listening to now, he's hero, Victor, and he can get some advice from Victor. <laughs> Hartley. What would be a lesson you perhaps learned while you were there in Stillwater as you were making your way to a U.S. amateur win and then eventually the pros? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Obviously, it's the coaches have a tough job because mm -hmm. they, you know, they want to help you, but every single player usually has their own college coach or they come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. and probably have some preconceived notions about what it is to play professional golf. And what was so great with Coach Bratton and even Coach Dar is that they have some experience on the highest level, whether it is caddying or playing, that I had an open mind to what I had to what they had to say. I took I listened to everything they had to say. And if I didn't agree, we just had a really good relationship to where we could discuss things and say, you know, hey, coach, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think that's applicable to me because I do it this way. So it's not necessarily you have to just listen to your coach um, no matter what he says, but we just created a relationship to where I respected everything that he had to say because he wants the best for me. And then we could discuss and talk about it, whether that is the best course of action for me. So I, I just think w Coach Bratton and I had a great bond where I really trusted him and and he I knew that he truly wanted what's best for me, that when he caddied for me in the USAM and at the Masters, uh, I just felt very comfortable. And I'm I'm not sure there's that many people that get to have a relationship like that with their college coach. Um, so I, I guess for kids going into it, you know, I, I've because I heard some rumors from Norway that some coaches can be very, um, you know, very strict in a way. They have it's either black or white, and sometimes that works if you're aligned on that same side as the as the college coach. And other times it doesn't work if you if you disagree. But I, I think just going into it with an open mind, and sometimes if you don't agree, just just still listen to to the opposite view and 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 see if it works for you that is so wise and look i'm a golf teacher deep down who was a college coach and i love your your just your thoughtful way about that because so many golfers and as i've watched victor now develop as a collegian you know winning the u.s amateur and i saw that on tv and now getting to know you on the tour it's like you've kept your own golf swing dna and, and, and it's so hard to get wrapped up when you think you should get better and then you try and copy this person or listen to that person, but you've remained singular to what you've done. And I'd love your comment there because I feel like it's very, very wise. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, there is obviously, you could find an optimal way to play the game of golf. Mm -hmm. And, but we all have our own unique way of doing it. And yeah. some things, aren't going to work for everyone. So you've got to find your own way to get better. And sometimes the path is not all that, uh, it's not always right in front of you. Uh, and I, I just thought 
the college coaches, you know, they had their own unique perspective on things. And I guess we, the more we talked and w- the more we discussed, we kind of, we, we found the, the path that was uh, right for me. And I, I think every, every single college player has to kind of look at it like that instead of thinking, oh, that's the way he's doing it. So I'm just going to copy him. And uh, I guess when you, when you take ownership of your own game, it's a lot easier to take that game to the next level, um, you know, from the college level to the PG, PGA tour or European tour or wherever else you're playing, because that's, that's when you really get to see if it's, it's if it's good enough. Yeah. I want to read you a quote that I read of yours and it made me smile. And it basically went, I'm trying to psychoanalyze myself, stopping, starting, pausing, I try to be a little stoic about things. I'm competitive. I want to beat people, but I don't go out of my way to show you I can beat you. It's more like, oh, I made another putt or I made four birdies in a row. And I let that <laughs> speak for itself. And then there's the smile with, and then you're like, and I, yes, I smile while I'm doing it. And I was, I read this and I'm like, this is quintessentially you. And so many young golfers, so many golfers can learn from what you're saying there when you're so mindful and you can kind of just enjoy what you're doing and smile while you're doing it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how I try to go about my business. Um, although I do think it's it's fun when you see the, I, like, I, I think the game needs some Brooks Kepka characters yeah. that are kind of not in your face, but they but they have a different way of of portraying things. They say things differently, and they are this alpha uh, player out there. You know, I, I, I do think the, the game needs some more characters and I, I do respect that, but that's that's where I feel comfortable. That's where I play my best golf. So that's that's why I've kind of adapted that mindset of uh, and, and playing the game that way. Okay, you're an alpha with a smile, okay? Because I've been, <laughs> <laughs> I've called you and I've watched your way with Shane Knight, your caddy, and I've watched how you take control of situations and stuff. And when I texted you, and I'm getting way out of audio of things I wanted to talk about, but I'm sort of (laughs) responding to your insight in your moment, okay? And there was a moment, well, first off, there was the ultimate alpha moment where you and Lud knock off Chef and Kapka, nine and seven. I mean, that wasn't just a win. That was like a screw you. So I would love you quickly to take us through that match and just how, I guess, you were in the zone, you were on a roll. And you just capitalized and just kept coming at these guys. Yeah, that was uh, uh, that was obviously a wild match. We, uh, Ludwig and I, we we played really well, but obviously got some stuff for free as well. But yeah. Luke Luke Donald talked about the whole week just how important it was to get off fast starts, mm-hmm. and I think that's what our team did so well. I think we won the the first the first hole a disproportionate amount of times compared to the U.S. teams. And obviously you win the first first hole. The other matches win the first holes. We have the crowds going in our favor. You look up at the scoreboard, you see a bunch of blue. And I think we just, we just felt so good in the moment and capitalized on that situation. And we just kept going. And obviously when the other team – maybe feel like they have to push, they miss, they short side themselves. They, they miss a couple of those putts they have to make to, to keep the match going. And uh, yeah, we just, we just kept on not giving them an inch. And um, yeah, it was just one of those matches that uh, ended up that way. Quickly in regular stroke play events, are you a scoreboard watcher? Yeah, I think it's, it's hard not to look, even Mm -hmm. though, I would say, I don't, this is something that I've kind of thought about a little bit recently. It's not looking at the scoreboard that's, uh, that is bad in itself or not looking. I think it's how you respond to looking at the leaderboard. I think before I was a little immature. I didn't have the best short game to get me out of situations. And I saw, okay, wow, I'm up on the leaderboard. I'm like two shots behind the lead with nine holes to go, I got to, I got to step up and, and make some birdies. And then I would short side myself, make a double bogey. And then I'm, I'm out of the tournament. Right now, just talking more to the people around me and my team, getting more experience, just seeing how a lot of the guys are winning tournaments. 
some obviously sometimes you win a tournament by making seven birdies or or five birdies to back nine and come from behind and and, and steal the show. But a lot of the times, if you just play your game, play like if I have a seven iron in my hand and the pin is back left, I'm just going to hit it to 20 feet. If I make the putt, great. If don't, if I don't, I'm still, I'm still in the tournament. I'm not going to give the tournament away. If someone goes out there and beats me, that's another thing, but I'm not going to give the tournament away. So I do like to see where I'm at, but I guess right now I've, I'm experienced enough to, to not let that change my game plan. If that makes sense. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, I experienced this front and center um, at Olympia Field <laughs> just a few months ago. Um, I'm on the group behind you. I've got Fitzpatrick and someone else. I can't recall who it was. And you were out in front of us, right in front of us. And it was nip and tuck. I mean, McElroy was there and obviously Scheffler was behind us with a lead and Fitzpatrick was going well. And all of a sudden, you just turn on the jets. And every time I looked up the fairway, I saw your rear end in the air picking another ball out of the hole. And you shoot 28 on the back and you shoot 61 to win. Um, you sort of appeared in the zone, kind of like I saw you some at the Ryder Cup too. I want you to talk mm. about that now when I'm in the zone, now when things really are going. What does Victor Hovland do in that area? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I knew so I could just get into that zone every every single time I tee it up. But um, I mean, obviously, I've. I've worked hard on my game and I feel like it's been in a, in a great spot, but I feel like a lot of it was just the mindset kind of change. Instead of trying to be so perfect all the time, I kind of looked at a 72 hole tournament in a different way instead of, okay, I have to shoot three under on this side to be in a good spot to have a chance to win the tournament on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was more like, okay, my game is good enough. I just have to, uh, use the right strategy, trust myself, and I'm going to get a spur where, okay, these nine holes, I'm not going to hit it very good. And I just need my short game to get me around, make a couple of nice up and downs, keep myself, okay, I shot even par on this front nine, and I know that if I get hot, I can really tear this place up. So the first two days uh, at Olympia Fields, I was, I think I shot – either two under and then one under the first two rounds, or it was even either one under and then even par. I, I can't quite remember, but I was pretty far back, but I knew I played some okay golf. And I, I knew that the last couple of, a uh, couple of days, I could really take it low. Uh, it was just a matter of getting hot and it just happened at the right time. I, I think it's, I think it's important to when things aren't going your way or, you're lipping out putts from 20 feet and you're hitting good shots, but not quite the right distances all the time. I think it's important to tell yourself, okay, I'm doing okay. And you know, the next day or the next nine, I might play, I might get on a hot streak. And that's, that's just what I did at East Lake and at Olympia fields. Yeah. Well, you took it on to the FedEx cup win at East Lake 63 in the final round there too. And that's no pushover of a golf course. Um, but as I listened to you, Victor, it's almost like as I read between the lines, you have defined for all the fans listening to you and wanting to improve. You know, all you PGA professionals, when we shove a microphone in your face, you're like, well, I'm going to stick to my routine and I'm going to be patient out there and that stuff. I feel like what you've just shared is you defining what patience on the course mm. in competition actually is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I've just uh, elaborated on the on the cheesy line, just trying to stay patient. But it is it is so true. It's like you got to look at a tournament as a seventy two hole tournament, mm -hmm. and you can you're not going to win it on the first day. But you can definitely lose it. And I know that my game is good enough, so I don't have to be super nervous the first you know the the first day I'm teeing it up. I just have to go out there and and play my game, play smart, miss it on the right sides. And I know that if I just take care of my business, I'm going to have a good chance come Sunday. And that thought process is very comforting. Yeah. Um, I don't have to do anything extraordinary uh, to, to be up there. I can rely on my short game. If my, if my long game doesn't, uh, is not on the level that it should be. And it's it just, 
and seeing that more and more often, I can, I, I, I'm proving that to myself. They just, I just uh, become more relaxed in the heat of the moment. Let's talk about that short game because I'm going to tear it up and I want your, your, your inside the ropes feel on the thing. And then I want mm. to talk about the short game improvements. Um, so you talk about fast starts with Luke Donald at Marco Simone. And you're in the second group off Friday morning and you get hit through the back of the green there. And this chip shot wasn't impossible, but it was freaking hard. And you don't hold the thing. And I was like, if ever there was a statement for the team behind you and for all of the thousands of fans, it was you. And that was Victor Hovland. And I smiled. And I smiled because that used to be the weakness in your game. And you open up under the highest of pressure and bury one and basically set the course for your team. So talk about the short game improvement. Yeah, that was that was a cool moment. Um, it was a, it was a tricky shot. I was at the back of the green and I had to go over a ridge there. And Shay was just thinking putter, um, <laughs> just put it up there to the fringe and let it down there and let it die down there. But I just thought, man, it's just not gonna stop. It's just gonna take the slope and and the gravity is just gonna take it probably ten feet mm-hmm. past the hole. And I just thought. I've trained this. I, I know how to do this. I can I can hit a low skidding chip shot in the bank, check it perfectly as it gets over the top and just trickle it down the hole. And <laughs> to do it at the first hole of the Ryder Cup in, in that moment, that amount of pressure, it was kind of, uh, it was crazy because I just remember hitting the shot and man, that looks good. And then as it got down the hill, I started walking up to the right to see uh, if it was going in or if it missed, I could see the line going past it. And as it got closer and closer, I just knew it, man, that that's going in. And uh, that was such a cool moment. And especially to, to, to start off the Ryder cup that way. I think that was, that was huge for momentum. Well, I was down the fairway next to the first tee with some of the corporate guests I was with and the roar that resonated down that fairway was electric man i mean you you must have had the hair on the back of your neck on end i'm sure (laughs) yeah i was a little surprised myself it was it was one of those you'll you'll take a par every single day uh i mean it's so easy to go there with with a five and then uh max and brian make a four and then we're one down now suddenly we're one up and it was um I i think it just it was um it kind of told the story for the week in terms of how we played as a team uh some of those spots we we just kind of gutted it out. We we made a couple of shots like that, and it, it's just so defeating to be on the other side. And I know I knew how big it was. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, so you take this weakness of yours, which was the work around the greens, and you turn it into a strength. Um, I'm keen to know the work that you did. But what impressed me the most about this whole journey you've been on was there was you were a young professional. It was Tory Pines on the North Course. Uh, the 17th hole, I think they might have flipped the nines, but it's that downhill par three. And number, it's normally eight. I think it's 17 for the tournament. Anyway, I mean, it's... At the, nor- at the north course, you north said? North course, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you're out there by yourself with Shea playing a practice round. It's late afternoon. It, the wind is blowing off the sea. It is cold. And mm-hmm. I'm just out there doing course recon. It's Wednesday afternoon. And you drop this five iron on the tee there and hit this five iron. And I looked at this and it was freaking downright sexy. And the way it was hit, it cut straight through the wind, middle of the green. And I was like, this guy's good, right? And then obviously you win in Puerto Rico, but you admit, well, you know, my short game sucks. And everyone loved you for admitting that. So you improve the short game. But what I'm fascinated by, and I want your take, is how through all that work where you were investing in your short game, how you maintained who you were, Victor Hovland ball striking, because I feel like, Time management is such a big deal. Yeah, it's tough. And what's tricky with the short game, it's it's such a dead opposite move to the full swing. Yeah. And I will actually say some of the things have crept in a little bit in my long game. And I haven't hit it as well as I would have liked uh, in certain tournaments, not, you know, long periods of time, but it's one of those where, you know, uh, in the short game, basically what I've done is that I've moved my center mass or my low point way more forward, way closer to, to the target. And that is a very bad move for me in the long swing because I have 
very little depth in my hands mm-hmm. uh, going down to the ball. So I have to almost get off my left foot and get back so that I can get some some depth in the hands going down. If I move forward and forward, I'm just going to hit really low kind of weak slices. And it's not the worst shot because I, I kind of know how to play with it. Mm-hmm. but it's not as good as as my best and the balancing act between the short game and the long game ha- has been tough but I, just when you know what you need to do it's a lot easier to to realize what you're doing you know when uh, if i start to see the ball kind of slice a little bit more than i would like I, I know exactly what i need to do and i'm just okay i need to back off of that but still in the short game double down on, on moving my low point forward because that's what's going to make me chip the ball better. So, and, and I need to credit Joe, Joe Mayo with, mm-hmm. with, the, with this information because when you, when you know you have the right information, it's a lot easier to trust it. Yeah. For the folks watching on YouTube, this is the universal right. Joe Mayo <laughs> sign for the audio listeners. It's my two fingers, middle fingers pointing down, four fingers pointing like in a V. Um, spin loft and you've been quoted as to say i try to use math and science numbers and stats to base my reasoning to guide me to better decisions and i also use common sense Uh, and i'm like then you go when you combine common sense with math and physics and you work hard that stuff's going to work out so for the golfers listening describe the whole spin loft thing and how you've bitten into this yeah so basically spin loft is just it's an angle and uh the downward angle uh, is the angle of attack and the upwards angle is the dynamic loft which is the loft uh, that is present at impacts mm-hmm. and what's tough is that obviously we're taught to get the the top vector pointing upwards that's yeah. the loft that's that's easy but the thing is a lot of people will even either back out or try to scoop the ball to try to get loft that way and that's when you you lose the angle of attack piece. It it, it gets very shallow. Yeah. And when it gets very shallow, it's hard to create good contact. So what I would do is I would tilt back and get weight on my right foot because that's what I do in my full swing. And I would hit the ground before, before the ball. The ball. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I get tired of doing that. So what I do is that I lean the shaft forward. Okay. And when I lean the shaft forward, I, I get better contact. But now this this uh, spin loft angle, obviously nice. it's shallow. Now it shuts down and it's you get a very, now. yeah, it, you, you create fastballs. Yeah. So what Joe told me, he said, hey, I know your wrists uh, is bowed in your swing. We're not going to change that because – Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, and Jordan Spieth, they have slightly flexed wrists, but they got to number one in the world. So I don't see why we have to tamper with that. Mm-hmm. And he just explained to me, if we can get the, the bottom vector, i.e. the angle of attack, a little steeper, it's then easier to create the loft later, which I was able to do. If I move forward, I can then throw the hands late to create the loft. but uh, most of the time, it, which has been cool, is that 80% of the time, I don't even try to hit it high. I just move as hard forward as I can, get very steep on it, and the ball is coming off really low with a lot of spin. And it's really easy to control for me. And if, if, I, if I have to get fancy and hit something a little higher, then I'll try to throw the, throw the club a little bit more at the bottom to create a little bit more launch. But the important piece is to get steep. Yeah, but uh, there's so many of the amateurs listening to this. If they were playing in a pro-am with you, they would be well served to do this. And if they want to get it up in the air some more, just open up the face, but still get that forward movement and the steeper angle of attack. You, you agree? Yes, 100%. It's just uh, the, the tricky thing with the short game is that it's, it's so elusive. Uh, you think, oh, I have to hit this shot high to, to get it over this bunker. Uh, to get it stop on the green and then you tilt back and try to scoop it and now suddenly you, you lose completely control of, of of the strike and and the ball is coming off hot when you actually do hit the golf ball first so 
it is a little bit counterintuitive, but if you understand spin loft and understand how to create friction that way, it, it becomes a lot easier to, to understand and actually apply it in, in the, in the short game. Love you, man. Okay. Um, this is all good news, sunshine, lollipops, all the good feelings and stuff. Um, yeah, he's smiling again. If you, if you're not watching on YouTube, um, <laughs> Victor to me, and I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but, but what you did at the PGA championship in 2023 was so admirable and you took a really tough situation and you basically learned from it and turned it into a couple of victories shortly thereafter. And for the folks who didn't see it, uh, I was with the Scheffler group. I'm out in front of Victor, Dottie Pepper for CBS was with him. And you played your way to the lead. Then 16, that par four. Look, you didn't hit your best tee shot, but it was a hard break with the ball plugs under the lip. You make double, Brooks makes birdie. That's basically it. I want your take on the shadow side of golf. Let's help golfers deal with disappointment. And you had disappointment on the biggest of stages there. I mean, you didn't know then that you were going to win another event and the FedEx Cup shortly thereafter. This was the mm. PGA and your a real shot at a major. Yet you dealt with it so well. So I want you to share your mindset, your attitude, because those are big things to successful golf consistently. Yeah, I, I think it's it, it's definitely one of those situations you can you can let that define your career a little bit. Uh, it was. First of all, I was just super proud that I was able to to get that far with Brooks. Obviously, I wanted to win, and I believed that I, I could win. But that was the first time, you know, the first time I was in contention was at St. Andrews in a major championship the year before. And the Masters was a, was a great step in the right direction. Uh, I had a, a chance to win before the last day or the last round and didn't play very well on Sunday but it was at least a, a great experience. And that major championship going head to head with Brooks Kepka, uh, now a five time major champion. I mean, that's, uh, that was just a really cool experience being in the thick of it. And yes, I made a mistake. I didn't catch it that well in the bunker, but it, 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 it was just such a freak moment. It already happened with JT and Corey Connors yes. earlier in the week. Okay. It's just one of those one of those things you just go, okay, yeah, I didn't. It was kind of sitting down in the lie and kind of on the downslope in the bunker, and I didn't catch it as good as I would have liked. But for it to plug in the bunker there, it's just it's just super unfortunate. But I was still I still left that week super proud about my um, play. I, I felt like I took a huge step in the right direction. And I created a lot of confidence. So I think it's just one of the, those things you can, you can choose to let it pull you down and, and think, man, how many, ch how many uh, chances are you going to get at winning a major championship? Well, not that many, but I believe that, especially now with the, with the improvement in the short game, I don't have to do anything really special to win those things. I, I truly believe that. Obviously, I got to, I got to have some luck. And I got to play really well, mm -hmm. but I don't believe it's going to be the last time I'm in that situation. So I, I kind of used it to, to fuel me in a sense. And, and um, obviously winning BMW and Eastlake after that, being a part of the a winning Ryder Cup team, it's just kind of, it's just helping even more. Uh, and yeah, it's I'm jet just fuel. Not really it's jet fuel. What do you mean? <laughs> God, good. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just super pumped to, um yeah get a get a new shot at uh major championships next year well they're coming um i want to say this you know having worked with a few major championships back in the day you know when i was younger and prettier um there's it's a, it's a high tension environment you know nerves are rampant people ask me about the masters and i'm like the thing about major championships and especially augusta national every shot's kind of on the knife edge and you never really ever settle down. Your body and your senses are always heightened. Um, and at the, at the Ryder Cup here in 23, I was there off the first tee in the chalet. And you were, I think it might have been Saturday afternoon. And you get out there and the fans are going bananas. They've been drinking the whole day and they're wild. And you make your two practice swings and they start cheering for you and singing your name. And you're like, let's lift it up. 
and uh, they go crazy. And then the camera, I see this environment, and then I look at the TV monitor, and then they cut close to you. Now, my heart's going fast for you, right? And they cut to you, and you just get the close-up of your face. And I see you kind of close your eyes gently, a couple deep breaths, and you step up, go through your routine, and lace one down the fairway. And I pointed this out to the guests because that was kind of my job, you know, inside the ropes, outside the ropes announcer. Mm. Like what he just did there was masterclass to settle down his system with all these nerves, all this stuff going on and hit a good shot. So I want you to talk about that, please, because I feel like that's one of your best weapons, just the ability to be calm amidst all the noise. Yeah, I think that's, I think it goes way back to where I feel like I have ownership of my, of my own golf swing. Obviously that I've had a lot of help uh from my prior coaches and joe mayo that's helped me you know understand it a little bit more uh but i think you have to take ownership of what you do you have to understand uh your flaws and and how it feels and if you do a certain thing what's going to happen but sometimes you just gotta shut that off and in that moment you just have to 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 tell yourself that hey i'm I'm ready. I know I got this. And yeah, I might hit a, a terrible shot there in the first, on the first hole, which, you know, might feel a little bit embarrassing because there's so many thousands of fans rooting you on. And the first tee shot is not, it's not uh, easy. Uh, and if you miss the fairway, there's, there's a punishment that comes with it. It's not easy to get on that green and two, but I, I knew that tee shot wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't life or death, you know, okay. uh, and that doesn't mean that, oh, I, it's okay. I don't have to hit a great shot, but it's like, it goes back to what I was saying. Okay. I have 18 holes to beat these guys. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, I don't have to strike this shot. I know I'm going to be fine because I have the tools to get around and, and play well. And I think instead of being super nervous in that moment, I kind of embraced it. It was more like, okay, let's get these crowds riled up and, and rooting for Team Europe, and I'm just going to pound it down there and put some pressure on the guys. That's that's kind of the mindset instead of, holy crap, that fairway looks narrow. I better catch it in the middle of the face. And, uh, yeah, I think it's just being uh, more more at ease in those moments. I love it. Um, two more quick questions. Let's help golfers, you know, get their work on. And I go back to your quote to say, look, I use data, but you couple that with work, and that's where the sweet spot basically is. So a day in the life of Victor Hovland, um, when you're preparing for a tournament, tell folks what it's like, please. Uh, at a golf tournament, when I get to a, a course? No no, um, no, no, just preparing. Or at home. Yeah, at home, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I like to, unless I'm struggling with something, I will, I'll basically just be playing all day. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really practice that much. Uh, I used to. But right now, I just don't see – I don't see a lot of value in me spending three hours on the range if I'm not actively working on something. Yeah. Uh, I basically – right now, I feel like I've gotten to a point where I have processes and structures around my game. I know where uh, – for example, in putting, I use aim point. I start the ball online in putting. So – I don't really have to work on putting that much. It's more, okay, I got the speed. Okay, the speed is good. So putting is fine. Now, short game around the green, just kind of get used to the certain lies. Okay, I'm hitting that low spinner as I should be. Okay, I've got the flop shot, whatever. Okay, that's check. And then in the long game, if I can swing it hard and know I'm not going to miss it left, I know that's – I have like these check boxes. And if I check these boxes, I know that my game's in good shape. And now it's all about going out there and playing, playing matches with uh, the guys that I'm around and, and kind of, yeah, trying to shoot a score. That's, that's essentially where I'm at. And if I go out there and play poorly, I think about it, okay, why did I make bogey or double bogey there? Was it a bad club? Did I misjudge the win? Did I short side myself? Was the miss acceptable in terms of you know is it within the the shot dispersion 
-hmm. or when I hit one that's like way off the planet, I'm like, okay, that was, that needs to be addressed. And either, you know, maybe there is mud on the ball or there's a swing issue that I need to take care of. So that's kind of how, how I go about it. I don't have like a, a set system or, or routine that I do. It, it kind of just depends on the day. Got you. I know the swing thought with a short game. Do you have a swing thought as it pertains to your full swing? Are you that sort of a guy? Uh, it's so basically my tendency when I don't hit it as well is that my hands tend to go pretty far out in the downswing. And it's tough for me to normally I'll hit it very straight, but I struggle with finding the center of the face. Yeah. Uh, but luckily, because I have a very stable release pattern, if I hit it slightly off the toe or slightly off the heel, it's not going to go way off the planet. I can usually find the ball. But uh, the, the, the two kind of things for me is that I try to swing up in the backswing yeah. and feel like my hands are almost staying there on top sometimes I have a tendency of pulling the arms down in mm. the downswing. So I try to stay patient, almost feel like my, my hands are sitting on top and then just feel like my lower body and my pelvis is really extending, uh, almost feel like my pelvis or my belt buckle is pointing at the target. Uh, when I, when I play bad, I pull with my arms and my pelvis kind of stays pointing down to the ground too long um so that that's basically the 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 two cues that i have uh the, that's what gets me in trouble when i'm not hitting my best folks you got to watch this on youtube victor's demonstrating as he talks all right what a couple of just random questions quickly um most nervous you've ever been playing golf uh man i, I i'd probably have to say whistling straights um uh, not the not the first tee shot but couple of those, I mean, I talked about my short game and especially around there when all the fans are rooting against you. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I think in those moments when you know you have some uh, inefficiencies, it, it definitely, it usually comes to light. Now, I don't feel like I, it wasn't like I chunked wedges and, and or bladed them over the green, but it would just wasn't as good as I would have liked. And I definitely felt more nervous instead of excited about hitting a great shot against the crowd or against the other team. And, um, yeah, uh, those, those moments are really stressful. Happiest you've ever been given you've won six times in the tour. You won the FedEx cup. Now you've been on a Ryder cup winning team. Um, us amateur champion. You've won basically at every, every level. Was there one that stands out? Yeah, I think, uh, winning the national championship at Oklahoma state, uh, at home, um, at Carson Creek with all the fans there. And I, I, I think that's, that's a super special moment. Um, winning, winning the Ryder cup last week was, or two weeks ago was really cool. I just really, you know, obviously winning for yourself is really cool. It's, it's, uh, I take a lot of pride and, and pleasure in that, but you can't beat the emotions when you win. Uh, with a team and people that you care about and you all have the same goal. Uh, I think that just accentuates the feeling to a, a degree that you can't really compare uh, in, in any other individual achievement. Now, maybe winning a major championship is, is different, but um, as of right now, I think just those winning those team events are, are so much fun. You're trending to that major. Um, have they named a street after you in Stillwater just yet, or is that coming? <laughs> uh we'll see we'll see about that one uh i gotta ask you this and then i'll let you go thanks for your time look i'm a fan of metallica i love alice in chains i mean i'm into that sort of stuff but i want to know how you keep so calm listening to bands like tool and system of a down and that sort of thing because i as a coach recommend to players i'm like before you play maybe you might want to consider something kind of easy listening for your swing rhythm but you're into stuff a lot more intense, I would call it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, sometimes, especially if I'm a little stressed, if I listen to too quiet music, it's almost like I want it to go faster and harder. Mm -hmm. Whereas it almost has the other effects. If it's too chaotic or, or 
very loud and heavy. It's almost like it calms me down, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. It's like I'm trying to match match the or do the opposite of the energy that I'm feeling. It's it's kind of weird, but I, I don't know. I just I I don't it doesn't amp me up that much. It's more like I'm trying to find the rhythm and the beats and uh, it almost settles me down a little bit. So for me, I can listen to it before I go to bed or before I go play. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You're one of the best, man. I still want to know why you don't have social media. Why is that? Well, I, I do, but I just, I'm not that um, active. I just don't, I'm not that active. I just don't feel, you know, I'll post something occasionally if I think it's funny or it's actually something that I want other people to see, but it's, uh, I don't know, social media can, there's a lot of bad with it too. So I, I'm just trying to post something if it's funny or it's going to give other people some sort of value for, for seeing what I'm posting instead of trying to, you know, showboat myself because I just don't, you know, it doesn't give me any satisfaction. You have been so kind to join us, to share all your insights, your experiences, take us inside the ropes. I know our fans around the world will love it. Um, enjoy your time off. Victor, I appreciate you and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. And I hope uh, uh, some of the listeners learned something. <laughs>